We have a story on the Bloomberg talking about new cases of reactivations. Now, in this particular um, instance, it's two patients in China who recovered months ago who have now tested positive for COVID-19. What does that tell us about a lingering virus and the possibility of reinfection? Yeah, that's a great question. Good morning. Um, so first and foremost, uh, while I'm not familiar with these specific, specific two cases, um, there are a couple of issues here. Whether or not the patients actually tested negative in between the positive results is important. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a patient myself this morning that um, has had now three months, three and a half months actually, of positive diagnostic testing with PCR. Uh, unfortunately, no negative test results in that period of time. So we do believe this person has been just continually uh, positive for COVID-19. Uh, this is a transplant patient, so it's a unique circumstance. In the two patients in China, it would be important to know whether or not they had negative tests and subsequently developed reinfection or remained positive throughout the entire duration. Jason, any insight into, I mean, do we have the data to know how many people, you know, in, in how many people we could see a reactivation? How difficult is it actually to get the raw data to understand what we're dealing with? Yeah, well, it's a couple of challenges here. Obviously, um, for example, the patient I'm seeing this morning, the, the reason that we are testing this patient multiple times is obviously they're very high risk as a transplant patient. In the general population, we don't retest people, and the CDC even came out with recommendations that said, you know, don't test people within the next 90 days. Don't repeatedly test individuals. So I think there will be a couple of um, opportunities to explore this question. People going through vaccine trials will likely get multiple repeat tests. People going through a couple of different immunologic evaluation studies uh, will get repeat testing. People receiving convalescent plasma might get repeat testing. Now, all of these, particularly the vaccine, the convalescent plasma studies, will be intervention studies. So we would not, we would hope to see that they were not repeatedly positive. So it's really going to be these studies focused on what's happening at the immune system level to determine whether or not reactivation versus reinfection is occurring. And that data is still emerging. Well, what does that mean for potential vaccines, Jason? I think it's a great question. You know, most importantly, if you think about what's happening right now with um, the theory, right, one of the major vaccines is an adenovirus vaccine vector, meaning we use the adenovirus to put the vaccine into the health, into the healthy patient. The patient then develops antibodies. Well, we all as human populations have been exposed previously to adenovirus and potentially that prior exposure could help us build antibodies to the actual vector used for this vaccine. So the Russia example, for example, that has not gone into clinical trials is a, is a really important potential um, finding here. So we don't know what's actually happening with that vaccine. People used in the mass population, the, the Russian uh, government has said they will use this in October, importantly, um, at a mass vaccine campaign level. Importantly, in that circumstance, if people begin to develop antibodies, it could have influence on whether or not vaccine, you know, campaigns work globally. So that will be our first data point about what vaccines may look like with certain forms of underlying vector. Um, Moderna vaccine, for example, is a different form of vaccine. And so we, we really need each of these vaccines to provide this type of data as quickly as possible so that we can understand about the potential of their efficacy.